Motives, get ready to have a direct insight into a professional athlete's mindset and outlook on life. Today, I'm joined with Shay Hillenbrand. Welcome back to the Behind Your Motive podcast. This is the first professional athlete we've had on, and it was an honor to listen to his story. Shay is an ex-Major League Baseball player, two-time All-Star, and now he's a successful entrepreneur. But no one gets to understand the true story these athletes tell themselves. He has experienced some very difficult days throughout his life, to the point where he actually retired at the prime of his career. He goes into detail around the mindset he had which led him to this complicated and painful decision. He turned down millions of dollars to ultimately retire and that goes to show that money does not result in happiness. And Shay's story is a clear indication why. So without further ado, let's get started. Motives, welcome back to the Behind Your Motive podcast. I have the privilege to be joined with Shay today. Uh, he is an ex-MLB player and now he's got his own Instagram brand and I've been fortunate enough to be able to interview him today. How are you going, Shay? I'm doing really good. Thank you so much for uh, having me on to, to share with your listeners. Maybe I could uh, add a little bit of value with some life lessons and some stuff that I've been through to really help people achieve their goals and their dreams. Perfect, perfect. I'd, I'd love to know um, what's been on your mind lately. How have you been lately? Uh, I've been very really good. I've been very good uh, transitioning into uh, a new career, uh, finding my true identity of who I am, uh, releasing those gifts and talents that I have within, within inside myself uh, to be able to offer that to people to help them solve their problems. So it's a, it's, it's a really good place that I'm in right now, a lot different place than I was in playing Major League Baseball. And, uh, you know, five, six, seven years after playing Major League Baseball uh, were the challenging trial times in my life to where uh, it was a pits of hell for myself, uh, losing everything that I made and went through to, to be at the top of the world. So uh, uh, very, very happy to be where I am now and excited to be able to share. Well, I'd love to learn more about your story um, and just your origin story and how you came up to become an MLB player and then to your transitionary phase because I know you've been I know you've transitioned out of your ex life into your new life uh, so I'd love to learn a bit more about that Shay. Yeah what's well, really cool and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to share um, this is what I've been born to do and this is uh, what I what I like I'm very very passionate and let me uh, I'd like to start with the reason why I do like what I do and a lot of people don't really understand why they do what they do but the reason why I, I do these things and go on podcasts and share my message and utilize my voice to help people rewrite their story is because I have an obsession, a deep obsession to be able to help people not feel the pain that I felt. A lot of people talk about pain, a lot of people talk about experiences in life, but the pain I'm talking about is when I was on top of the world, living my dream, the dream that so many people have around the world of, of being a celebrity, being on TV, being a, kind of like a rock star in front of millions of people on a nightly basis. Uh, but it all started when I was a, real, uh, a young kid. I wouldn't say young lad, because you guys might say that over there. Uh, but uh, it, it's uh, ever since five years old, six years old, seven years old, I had a baseball in one hand and a glove in the other hand, uh, pursuing my dream of becoming a major league baseball player. So, you know, professional athletes, especially, uh, you know, athletes here in the United States, baseball players, we've been pursuing this. This has been our identity ever since day one. You know, so many uh, children, young boys across the United States, there's 3 million huge baseball players in the United States, and 0.05% uh, of those 3 million huge baseball players get a chance to play professionally. So wow. there's so many kids across the world at that that would love to play Major League Baseball. So it's, a bit, it's been ingrained in me, and I've been pursuing this dream Actually, I had two dreams when I was a kid, and I accomplished both dreams, and not many people get to do that. So uh, as I take you along on this journey, uh, I want to place an emphasis and an importance on identity, understanding the story that we tell ourselves from a very young age. So like I said, since a very young age, I always wanted to be a major league baseball player, and I always envisioned that, and I always ingrained that into my belief system but along the way, without me knowing and understanding at a subconscious level, 
my belief system had been formed through experiences that I experienced along the way, especially with my father. So there's so many young men, some you know, mostly young kids that always look up to their dad. Always, that's the male influence, that's the first father influence in their life. And experiences and interactions with your father define you. And a lot of times before seven years old, the prefrontal cortex, the front part of our brain, isn't fully developed. And what I want to share with you is that the reasoning, the processing, the understanding of how you engage in these experiences throughout our life and then interpret those experiences and then in return communicate those experiences is extremely important. And that's what I'm going to convey to people as I take you along this journey of my life and the journey along the top of having success and becoming and ultimately living the life of a super star major league baseball player. Because the experiences that I had with my father at a very young age were very challenging. He would always yell. He would lash out, very emotional. He always lived his emotions on his sleeve. And this is kind of like a generational curse that happened in my family. And the reason why my father's belief system and his characters, uh, characteristics that he formed uh, were because of what he experienced with his dad. So I kind of was on the receiving end of that, and it really affected me. So every time I go into an experience to where I was looking for approval from my father, where I was looking for uh, acceptance from my father, love, admiration, I never received that really, so I perceived. So whenever I had these experiences to my, with my father and authoritative figures, I would interpret those experiences a certain way, and the communication I used in my, my mind and myself, how I communicated that to me, was not too good. So what happens is when you communicate those experiences to yourself, brother, you uh, it forms your belief system. And your belief system that you form at a subconscious level, it's going to dictate and discern the decisions that you make on a daily basis or how you're going to interact and navigate through future experiences of your life. So it's super important. And I'm not just saying this because I'm a psychologist. I'm saying this because... I played in front of millions of people. I flew private jets. I had three mansions. I had six cars. I would have little girls in the stands hold up signs saying, we would marry and Shay because I was that rock star that all the kids looked up to when I was playing for the Boston Red Sox. I would do autograph signings for $10,000 for one hour, only 500 autographs, sign my name, and I, I just make so much money. But through that process, I had little girls come to the table, teenage girls, as I was a professional athlete, crying and shaking because they got to meet me. Just because they got to meet me. But all the while, the story I told myself up through my whole life because of experiences with my father, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, and my dad doesn't love me, formed a pain inside of myself and a disconnect from myself because all I was seeking was approval from my dad. Mm. And I think this is relatable to a lot of people. See, a lot of people can't relate to two-time MLB, major league baseball all-star, being up on the field, uh, having all the success, but they can relate to the challenges that we have internally. But when you're treated like a god, and when you're treated like that situation of, of so many people idolizing you, what they couldn't see is that deep, deep pain resonating inside of myself, resonating deeply in my soul, fueling that pain during the game. So at 14 years old, I grew up in Southern California. It's kind of like the Gold Coast over there. It's a hot spot. The celebrities live there. The weather's great. You got palm trees. You got the beach. But most importantly, I had all my friends, where I found my community, where I found my identity, through sports and my friends. And my dad walked into my room one day, and he said, hey, I'm going to move our family from beautiful Southern California to the hot desert of Arizona. I don't know what place or state is in towards the middle of Australia, but I know the outback is out there, yeah. and it's hot. Yeah. And it's deserty. And not many people live there. And that was my perception of moving from Southern California where it was great to the hot desert of Arizona. So when my dad left my room when I was a kid, the story I told myself was, I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. My dad doesn't love me. Because how could he uproot me from my community of friends and my sports? This is right before my first year of high school, which would be 10th. Uh, grade 10 here uh, as a sophomore yeah. and just leaving middle school or junior high. And this is where kind of like the formative years of your life. So as I reluctantly left all my friends, I decided to become an overachiever through athletics. So in high school, I became the number one soccer player in the state of Arizona. I was the best soccer player. And I loved soccer. But growing up, I wanted to be a major league baseball player. 
So I didn't have any opportunities to go anywhere after high school to play baseball to pursue my dream in college. So I walked on at the local community college, and the only reason I made the team was because of my work ethic. I was the first guy there, and the last, last guy to leave every single day. And after my sophomore year, my last year of junior college, I became the number one baseball player, junior college baseball player in the state of Arizona. But what drove me was I wanted to go to the top. I wanted to be at the apex of my career. I wanted to be one of the very best in the world at baseball. So I got drafted by the Boston Red Sox. And I played five years in the minor leagues. You got to go through the process, the rankings. And, and it, was, it was very challenging. It was tough. But I was player of the year. I was a number one player on each of the team I was on in the minor leagues three of the five years. So actually one of the years in, in the winter here and in the summer there, I went and played baseball over in, in Australia. And it was a great experience. It was amazing to experience how you guys are there. Um, it, it was a great uh, cultural experience for myself at that age. I think I was maybe 20 years old, 21 years old. Uh, right around that, yeah. But uh, uh, with five years in the minor leagues, I uh, finally got my shot to become a major league baseball player. Like, like I worked my way to the top. And it's opening day in Baltimore, Maryland. We're playing the Baltimore Orioles, and I'm on TV, ESPN, and I'm 25 years old, and I'm crying because I accomplished my dream that I set, I set out for. Like, like, I just wanted to pursue that. And I wanted to, like, it's just like, I did it. Like, a lot of people don't realize the work ethic of what it takes to go out there and the belief system that you have to create. And so many times you want to give up for the process and you get knocked down and you get you fail and you have adversity. But the majority of people allow those failures or setbacks to define who they are mm -hmm. rather than allow that to, to refine who they are to tap into the ultimate, ultimate ability of who you are as a human being. Yeah. But what's crazy is through that process of being on the field, I had this internal turmoil. I had this pain inside of myself as a major league baseball player. I accomplished my dream. And what happened is that pain over the time kept, kept manifesting, kept getting bigger. Because all I wanted was approval. Like my why for why I was playing baseball, pursuing my dream was super unhealthy. See, what happens when you have, uh, have something you set up to do, a dream, a vision, or goals, you have to have a why. And that why has to be strong a super strong why, and it has to be greater than you. And you also have to attach whys that are negative whys to what you try to do because uh, you want to have pain attached to it. If I don't accomplish this, what am I going to feel? What am I going to experience? Because us as human beings, we're always trying to run away from pain and seek pleasure. So my why, well, the reason why I tell you that is because my why for playing major league baseball was unhealthy. It wasn't sustainable. It was attainable, but it wasn't sustainable because I wanted to get approval. But I didn't realize that because I was at a subconscious level of my belief system. I was never good enough. I was never lovable. And I wasn't wanted. That's what I thought from the stories that I created in my mind, from the experiences that I experienced, interpretations, communications, form the stories in your mind. So here I am after seven years playing major league baseball. I'm super successful. I'm in the prime of my career. I'm making millions of dollars. I have $18 million I've already made. I've had highlights after highlights after highlights. I've done things on a baseball field that so many people wished they could. I was a two-time All-Star, like you said. I, I, I've done so many things. I'm at celebrity status. But what people don't realize is that we're human beings too. So after my seventh season, I'm sitting on the couch in my family room, and I was having my, my son in my arms. See, after all the highlights, all the glory, all the fame, uh, of becoming a superstar baseball player, all I wanted to do is be a father, and I wanted to be a daddy. But I was disconnected, and I didn't want my my son and my children. I have three. I have three adopted children, and I, I didn't want them to feel what I felt. So I was having this moment with my son on the couch, and I was trying to have like a father son moment. Like I'm so proud of him. I'm looking into his eyes. I see a bright future for my son. I'm like, this is amazing. I love him, and all I wanted to do because he was right around two years old, was show him how much I loved him. Mm -hmm. I wanted him to, I wanted to gaze in his eyes and show that agape love, that unconditional love, and I couldn't. I couldn't connect to that love. All I can connect to is with that pain that I was feeling from those stories that I tell myself year after year, after experience, after experience, experience, interpretation, communication, story, belief system, decisions, 
see what what's, what's going to drive your decisions that you make on a daily basis is two things, and that's going to be your beliefs and your values. And my values weren't really great. I didn't have good values because I was a major league baseball player. I didn't have to do anything but win in baseball, and I could do I could act any way I wanted. See, my character was flawed. I had become the asshole of the clubhouse. I had become the cancer of the team. I had become that guy that nobody wanted, but they had to have me on their team because I performed. I waited. I went out there and I won games and I produced and I did what they wanted to do on the field, but off the field, internally, man, I struggled. I struggled deeply. So I had this. I had disconnected from who I was, and when you disconnect from who you are, you become numb to everything. So I was numb to everything and everybody around me. And I'm gonna hold my son in my arms and I, I make the biggest decision of my life right there. Not consulting anybody, not talking to my wife at the time, not talking to my parents at the time, not talking to my business manager, not talking to my financial advisor, not talking to my agent, not talking to anybody with anybody around me. I'm right there and I make a decision. See, that decision that I made, that pain that drove me to that point to, to make this decision was a very difficult decision. I quit. I walked away. See, I walked away from that one childhood dream I had that I worked so hard for for such a young, young kid. See, I walked away from everything that everybody else quit on. When people were, were saying it's too hot, I was working outside working. When they said they were sick, I was out there working. I was grinding it. I was pursuing it. I was refining who I was to make that my myself become mentally so strong that I could achieve that goal that so many people wish they could do. So you have a better chance of winning the lottery than becoming an all-star in the major leagues. Because if you talk about the numbers, it's insanely difficult to do. And I did that. I accomplished all that on the field in front of everybody, that external success that everybody's trying to seek when they become an entrepreneur, when they seek out the, the car, like, that's meaningless. I had all that. I lived the life that would blow your mind away. I walked away from it. And it broke my heart because I didn't know who I was. See, my identity was being I was a major league baseball player. My identity was what I did. I didn't have an identity outside of baseball, but I convinced myself that if I, did, if I just come home to be a father to my three children with millions of dollars in the bank and pursue my second dream of owning a zoo, everything would be great. Yeah, you heard that correctly. I bought a zoo. I don't know if there's been any Major League Baseball player that's ever done that. I left Major League Baseball in the prime of my career, right smack dab in the middle of my career when I was at the height, making a ton of money. Actually, I left $50 million of potential earnings on the table to walk away because that pain drove me. I can't stress to you enough. The story that you tell yourself is going to form your belief system, and that story that you tell yourself on a daily basis, most people are chock full of limited beliefs, and bullshit. I'm telling you, man, because so many people don't achieve what their dream is and their vision is, what they're set out to do, because their belief system on a lower level, at the root level, isn't aligned with that. They actually believe that they really can't achieve what they did, and what they could do, what they're setting out to do. So right now, I'm asking you, and I'm asking your listeners, what are you setting out to do? What's your vision? What's your dream? What are, you trying to, what are you trying to achieve? That's cool. You have to identify that target to set yourself to go up that because our RIS, our reticular activating will kick, the system will kick in, and it will go like a heat, the heat signature and a heat seeking missile. And it will go. I did it. But what's driving you? Why are you doing it? Is your belief system in line with that? Because most people's belief system isn't. Because when they get knocked on their butt, when they get get into a, a, a failure situation, when they get into a challenge, or they hit turbulence, what happens is their subconscious level, it's going to reaffirm that belief system, say, you know what, you can't do it. I told you you couldn't do it. I don't know why you think you're trying to have these people on a podcast, because you're no good, you're too young, you don't know what you're talking All that stuff that we tell ourselves inside internally, that's going to kick in. But that's formed by our belief system. That's when by our belief system. Like most people think our conscious mind is very, well, that's nothing. That's nothing compared to our subconscious mind and our belief system. But once you align that belief system up with identifying who you are with what you're trying to achieve, your dream and your vision, there's nothing that can limit you. So when you stand in your true identity of who you are as a person, there's no competition, though. 
Like in the space that I am right now, see, I thought I was supposed to be a major league baseball player, but this is what I'm supposed to do. Because when I identified my true identity of who I was and who I am, and I have a four-step formula to be able to help people with that, to identify and to tell your story so you can create your branding of who you are and move all that around that and monetize that and help people solve their problems, whatever. I believe everybody's been born with a gift and a talent. And I believe that gift and talent was to help other people solve their problems. And when you stand in there, bro, they're like, there's no competition, man. So I walked away from baseball in the prime of my career, and I went and bought a zoo. I bought a $5 million farm, and I accumulated 300 farm and exotic animals. I had camels. I had kangaroos. I had llamas, alpacas, raccoons, monkeys. I had everything over the moon. I had this vision. See, God, when people, God puts vision or, or vision, whatever people believe in. I don't, want to, you know, I don't want to persuade my beliefs on the people because that's not what this is about. There's visions in our mind. Those have been given to you. Because you're supposed to pursue those. That's part of our purpose of what we're doing. So I had this vision of rescuing these animals and getting these animals in a situation to partner them with inner city disabled and child crisis kids in our community through my nonprofit foundation, man. The things that happened at that farm were, were absolutely amazing. I transformed kids' lives on a daily basis. It was rock star stuff. There's stuff that happened at that place that you know I had that was super magical because that was given to me and I just pursued that. It was way better than anything I ever did on a major league baseball field. But check this out. After four years. See, what happens is when I left baseball, uh, all the fame didn't do it. All the glory didn't do it. All the money didn't do it. All the star setup didn't fill that void that I was trying to fill inside myself. See, that identity that I created and I disconnected from who I was as a baseball player, I was driven by pain. And a lot of people don't realize that. Let that pain drive you. But we've got to figure out and identify where that pain is coming from so we can put that pain in proper context. See, I couldn't do that. See, when I was experiencing that pain, I had flaws in my character that acted like an asshole to people to keep them away so they didn't see that true hurt little boy inside because I was superstar status. And it was very difficult to do. But once I discovered where that pain came from, it changed my life. But what happened is, when I had this farm, when I had this zoo, after four years, I became the biggest and baddest place in town. I rescued those animals. I rescued a uh, hundred dogs, and I adopted them out. I had fifty-six horses that I rescued. I just like I was like Steve Irwin, bro. That's Australia, Steve Irwin. The crap. I was like him doing here in the states. Like I knew animals way better than I knew baseball, and that was my dream, and that was my vision. But what happened? is that pain came with me. Those character flaws came with me. That emptiness, that the emptiness came with me. And it kept manifesting. And it kept growing. And it kept becoming a distraction because I didn't know what was causing that. So after four years, I had received my third foreclosure notice on my farm. My 15-year marriage was falling apart. I was losing the millions and millions of dollars that I made playing Major League Baseball. And I lost my family. I lost everything, bro. I had nothing left. So people don't realize when I was playing Major League Baseball, I was getting 500 texts on my birthday. And at that time, when I was the lowest part of my life, I had two texts. No one cares about you when you're on the bottom. You can quickly be forgotten when you lose everything. It was hard. And not, even, not two of those texts weren't even from a family member. See, I cut my parents out of my whole baseball career on top of the world because that story I told myself at 14 years old, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough, my dad doesn't love me. And it killed me. Because here I am. See, see, money masks a lot of things. And a lot of successful people out there are surface-level people because their vision is to go out there to accomplish this material stuff. They get the private jets, they get the matches, they get the millions, and they get the cars, and they get the flashy stuff. That means nothing, dude. And I say that because of experience, because I lived that. I had quickly become the biggest asshole around. And it sucks because it hurt me, because that went really against every part of my being and my makeup of who I am, because this is who I am. I'm not an asshole. So the, so the passion that you see now that, that's, that, that's fueling the love, that's fueling that, 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 that eagerness, that obsession to not let people feel it, that, that passion was fueling that pain before. And it sucked because I didn't understand where that pain was coming from. 
So I lost everything and I started going to spiritual work because I believed in God and I'm a Christian. And I started going to church. I had nothing left. I had nothing left. I lost everything in my life. I was riding a bicycle, my son's bicycle to church. 45 minutes every Sunday. I was going to church because I was obsessed to try to find balance on the inside. I wanted to find balance between my spirit, my mind, and my body. And I was there all the time. I was at church Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night. Like five days a week, I was at church because I was trying to find myself. And I, was, I started speaking schools. I started speaking churches in the pulpit. And I started speaking prisons. And after I got finished, so many people would come up to me. Like, I actually had, I would be speaking in prisons, and I would leave the building, and I would have inmates trying to walk out with me to leave because the anointing I had on me, the passion and the love I was speaking from my heart, were they drawing and gravitating towards that. And I would turn around and be like, y'all know you can't leave, right? You're like, you're incarcerated. You know, so it's just crazy because it's so many people like, dude, you just changed my life. But I go home at night, and I'll be thinking like, I'm only operating at 60% of what I'm capable of doing. I know I'm capable of so much more. I know I'm not good at what I'm doing. And I still have that pain resonating inside of me after going to church, after giving up my life over to Christ, after connecting with God. So I quickly realized, brother, that I was just putting a Band-Aid on that wound mm -hmm. of that story I was telling myself in my belief system. I don't want to, I don't want to say I am like that kid that was molested, I don't want to say that I was like, I'm like that prostitute that was trying to go to church to find themselves, but I felt similar feelings because that story I told myself through my belief system, and it didn't allow me to tap into my spiritual part of who I am, and it limited me because I had limited beliefs derived from my belief system. I can't tell you enough. The story that you tell yourself, I am here to help people rewrite the story because I was one breath away from losing my life. So what happens, brother, is that when I realized that even church was putting the band-aid on that pain, I found myself on the floor of a van. See, what people don't realize, I was on top of the world. I lost everything six years ago. I was sleeping in a van. And I was scrounge up change out of the cup holder in my van after being on top of the world, making $350,000 every two weeks. I was trying to get change out of my cup holder in my van just to feed my kids pizza. I couldn't even feed my kids anymore. You know how humiliating, humiliating that is for a father and for a celebrity and as a man? And you know how badly I wanted to die because I couldn't figure out who I was on top of the world? Not figure out who I was on the journey of just being a person. I was on top of the world living the life. And I find myself in the floor of a van. And after overdosing on drugs and alcohol, here lies a guy that so many people envy. So many people wanted to be just like me. And my kids were going to school telling all their friends that I was a major league baseball player and I'm laying here numb and motionless. And as the soul's leaving the top of my head, brother, and I was hanging under my last breath because I couldn't fight that pain-driven game anymore. The thoughts. People don't realize those spots going rampant control what you do. You're a failure. You're a loser. You lost everything. These are racing through my head as I'm there lying, grasping over my last breath. What would your parents think if you left this world today? What kind of dad would do this to his kids? Are you serious? You said you quit baseball to come home to be a dad and you do this? And my answer to that, I don't know. I'm nothing without baseball. That had become my identity. So I, so, so I, I want to have you... Understand this as you're a young kid trying to pursue your dream. I'm sorry, I don't mean to call you a young kid. I'm an old man. I'm 45. But you've got to be careful with how you attach yourself because you're a person that's pursuing this. And if you don't know who you are, it doesn't matter what you do. So I finally let go. I don't know if I died or if I fell asleep that night in the van. I was tired of fighting that pain during the game. Like I said, I was done. But by the grace of God, I woke up the next day. I woke up, and the sun peered through, uh, peered through the front windshield of the van and went in my eyes, and it woke me up. And as I came to, I realized I had no side effects. See, the concoction of pills and alcohol I drank and took the night before, I had two options. Because when you're a super, superstar celebrity, like, you do things extreme to, like, obsessive street. And I, the stuff that I took the night before, man, and alcohol and the pills, to numb that pain, I shouldn't even have been dead or in the hospital. And I woke up and I had an aha moment. And I did what I, all I ever knew what to do is to keep on. See, my nonprofit foundation is against all odds, and that's all I know is to fight against all odds. When your back's against the wall, 
There's no other thing that you got but yourself. And if you don't figure out who you are, like I said, I don't care what you do. But by the grace of God, for two years leading up to that point, when I was going through this discovery phase, I would pray to God every single night to bring this woman into my life to help me, to help me discover who I am. Because I was a celebrity, but I didn't know who I am. Like so many successful people out there, they don't know who they are, and they're not finding true fulfillment and tapping into truly who they are to make an impact on other people's lives. They're doing the surface level of success, and it breaks my heart. And I most importantly pray for two years to bring a mother into my life for my children because my adopted children struggle with that influence in their life because I was divorced. But what I'm trying to say is God brought my wife, Kristen, into my life right now. We've been married for five years. And it took someone else to help me through that process of creating a new identity to discover who I really was, and most importantly, recreate the belief system. What I want to share to you is like most people don't know, after 35 years old, it's almost impossible for a man to recreate a belief system, especially a celebrity superstar, and I did that. And with this new identity, I want to use my voice, my gifts, and my talents, and most importantly, my story to help other people discover their voice and use their voice, which is their gifts and talents, their purpose, to impact the world. So that's what I'm doing now. So I appreciate you letting me take you on that little bit of journey. So it's like, it's crazy what I've been through. And you can see the pureness of the passion in my voice of what I'm doing. And there's a reason of where that's coming because that's what I'm supposed to do. I didn't have this voice the majority of my life. I didn't even know who I was. I couldn't even talk. Like, I don't know if many people know in Australia, but Yankee Stadium, and it's like the Yankees are the biggest thing. They're like, uh, maybe, I don't know if they still are, but maybe like the All Blacks. From, uh, uh, from rugby, like the, 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 the rock stars. But yeah. I performed, I was amazing in that environment. Like, I, I like 45,000 people, like the craziness, the pressure, like I performed and I, rock, I rocked it every single night in that stadium. But I would go out for a dinner at the end of the night at a five star restaurant, super nice restaurant. I'd be watching myself on ESPN, on highlights on TV. But I couldn't get up from that seat of that table at that restaurant and walk across the restaurant to use the washroom because I was afraid of everybody staring at me. I'd always pee my pants every single night because I had no self-confidence. I had no identity of who I was outside of what I did. And that's nothing but a recipe for disaster. But like, like people are like, oh, Shane's pretty cool. Like, it's amazing. But I had to do a complete transformation. I went on a 12-year journey of trying to figure out. It was tough, man. It was very difficult. But... I would never change what I've been through. I would never change any part of my life because that's my story. And every pitfall, and every challenge, and every struggle I went through, it's just another tool in my tool belt to help people like you and to help people and listeners uh, that, that are listening to your amazing podcast that you have because it's not all life, life's not all dandy. The road to success is, is amazingly difficult and I got that experience and I got the tools and the success to get through that. And that's why I have my smile on my face because I just, if I just have one person on your podcast, that's what I'm here for. Yeah, that's insane. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing that story. I felt like I was in a movie just watching it unfold. Um, I didn't even know I could do this. I didn't even know I could share this. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, what is this? Like, it's crazy. I can't tell you. When you line yourself and find your true identity, dude, like, like, it's crazy what happens, man. Like, you won't have many major league baseball players or, or many professional athletes be this authentic, share the pitfalls. But like I told you at the beginning, like not many people could relate to that. Yeah. That's what I played in Canada. <laughs> not many people could, but they can relate to being one breath away. They can relate to wanting to give up. They can relate to those thoughts of, of, of limiting beliefs and self-defeat. I'm like, dude, you're the biggest piece of crap in the world. You can't do this. You're too fat. I mean, when my wife met me, she always tells me, this is six years ago. She always tells me I was fat, bald, and homeless when she met me. And it's crazy. It's true. And it's just like, when I left baseball, I sat parked. When I lost my phone, I sat parked for five years. I didn't want to do anything. I was numb. I was, I was like, how do you do this? Why do I say that? Because I was that person that lived my dreams. I was that person that was supposed to be happy. I was that person from the outside that everybody thought, like, gosh, he's got everything going on. But I had nothing going on on the inside. And it sucked. This, I struggled, but I'm so grateful for doing that. That's awesome, man. And like that just goes to show how much your internals matter, how much 
the thoughts that you that you tell yourself matter the people that you surround yourself with matter uh because it's no matter how much like fame you have obviously i haven't experienced that so i i, I haven't experienced your life you've experienced your life so but the the amount of fame you have it doesn't matter unless you understand yourself isn't that correct so 100 how are you how are you helping people like you say and how and allow me to understand how you got over those negative thoughts, those limiting beliefs that you had and how you're actually thinking more positively now and, and living your best life now. Thank you. That's a great question. I appreciate you asking that uh, because I'd like to share uh, th those things that I went through. It, it, it's, it's my truth and it's what I apply. And I'm pretty like, I was like the Tasmanian devil, like going through Major League Baseball. I was a wrecking ball. Like I have story after story after story of, of getting into uh, bad arguments, bad situations, saying bad things to, to authoritative figures. Like, but all those authoritative figures were my father. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that. So what got me to understand the baseline for me to get through, to, 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 to break through that point of who I was before, that was – Fueled and driven every single day by pain. I was making seven million, six and a half million dollars in Anaheim, playing for the Angels in my dream city, living in a mansion, and like living my life. Like this, and the first word out of my mouth every single day when I woke up was the F word, ah, like loud. My wife's like, "What's wrong with you?" I'm like, "I don't know." And that that was driven because of the stories of my belief system. So once you understand your story. Once you understand what drove you to where you are now. See, everybody's telling themselves a story right now. And in your belief system and experiences, like if you reverse engineer that, right? So we're telling ourselves a story right now. If you're telling yourself a story before you got this podcast, while you're doing this, what you want to do. So if you reverse engineer it, that comes from decisions that you made to lead you to this point. And the decisions that you made, like I told you, come from two things. That comes from your beliefs and your values. And you have to understand what your beliefs and your values are. Everybody establishes those differently. And what's going to drive your beliefs and your values? You reverse engineer that back one step, that's your belief system. Mm -hmm. And your belief system, reverse back one step, comes from communication. The communication comes from your interpretation of what? The experiences you have on a daily basis, right? So everybody's going to experience or interpret experiences differently. I have five kids now because my wife has two beautiful daughters. I have two uh, beautiful uh, uh, stepdaughters and my three adopted children. If I go and have an experience with each one of those children, they're going to interpret that and communicate that 100% differently, each and every one of them. That has to do with your makeup, how you are. So the, the, the most crucial thing is, is that you have adults and mentors and leaders have to help younger people process through that and understand how to work through those different experiences. See, the human brain isn't fully developed to what, 19, 20, 21? So, so up until then, it's crazy what happens in your life, the formative years. So once I understood why I did the things that I did, why the, uh, why, how I formed the character flaws, and that's the biggest thing I like to touch on, is that I didn't like the character that I had. But the character that I had was driven from, was formed, from the pain I was feeling. And the pain I was feeling was from communication, interpretation, experiences, yada, yada, yada. It's all the same thing. Once you understand it, it's pretty cool to understand how things work because our mind is systematic. The uncluttered mind is systematic. And you always have to have processes and systems in place. And I drive my wife nuts. She's like, that's all you talk about. I'm like, that's the only way to have success. You have to have processes and systems in place. But you can't do that unless your mind is uncluttered. See, if you have generalized focus of what you're doing, it's going to cause confusion. The byproduct of that fear is going to creep in, and the byproduct of that, no self-confidence. So whatever task you set out to do, whatever you in, do, when you're doing where you're at, you have to have a specific focus. When you have a specific focus on a task at hand, the way you apply that is systems and process. Step one, two, three, four, and once I achieve that, I get a dopamine release, and then I get self-confidence boost. So when I take out the trash, I have a four-step process. When I mow the lawn, I have a five-step process. When I make my bed, I make it a seven-step step process. My morning routine is the same every single day. Why do people do that? Because the mind is systematic. And when your mind is systematic, the only way your mind can be systematic is to have it uncluttered. See, there's so many things going on right now. There's so many things that people want to do, like, like technology, like 
What do I need to do over here? What do I got to do over here? Everything's going so fast. It's social media, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, IG, or, 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 uh, LinkedIn, whatever it is out there. People are like, uh, uh, uh. It, like Amazon will deliver whatever you want on your doorstep the next day. Uh, if I want to binge watch a whole series of a season, I can do that through Netflix right that night. Like everything's on demand right now, which is good, but it's very difficult for people to understand how to work themselves because they have all these external distractions that don't allow you to focus on one thing and then place that understanding of how to implement those systems and create that uh, dopamine release. And, and the, the big dopamine releases by all these external fixes that are masking self-confidence and belief in themselves. So once we understand that, or reverse engineer everything, that I'm telling you, dude, everything comes from your story and how your story is. Your branding comes from your story. Everybody has your own unique story. Some people are like, oh, my story is this. I don't have a really cool story. Shay's got a cool story. No, I don't have a cool story. I got a lot of life shit. <laughs> if you want to think that's cool, uh, that's cool. But I don't want anybody to go through. That's why I told you at the beginning. That's my why. That's my why. I'm an obsessed for people not to feel that pain because that pain sucks, dude. Like, it's crazy. I was one breath away. So if you understand your story, you're going to tap into your true identity. And when you tap into your true identity of who you are, you're going to discover that gift that you've been given. Whether it's by God, the universe, whatever it is, we all have a gift. Many too. You won't be able to discover those and you, until you align yourself with your true identity. So many people don't want to align themselves with their true identity because they don't want to experience, relive those experiences and how they interpret it and communicate those experiences. Because a lot of people have been through a lot of heck, right? So a lot of people will go to those internal parts of themselves, and that's where I love. That's where I get my. That's where I get my feel. As I hold people, I walk them through that journey of that internal turmoil, that crap. Why can I do that? Because I've been there. I understand it. Like I got a PhD in this stuff, almost like like it's just like crazy. Like my experiences of how I get down there with information, everything that I do. So most people won't go there. But let me tell you what: the true power isn't a two-time all-star in the major leagues. The true power now is vulnerability. That's how you connect with people. That's how you get people to trust you. That's how you get people to like you. And that's how you get people to buy your product through your story. Then, then if people don't buy a product, people buy the story behind the person that's selling the product. Yeah. And that's what people need to understand. Well, man, that's, yeah, and I definitely agree. And um, I'm reading a book now, Start With Why, and that book literally explains what you just explained in another perspective. So that's why I relate with this a lot. Obviously, I don't relate with your story, uh, I haven't experienced those things yet, but uh, it's a great it's a great way to think because you need to be able to identify with yourself. And if you could explain how people can identify with themselves, how they can actually go down that journey of trying to find their purpose, like that's a big uh, touch point on this podcast with my guests is how they can find their purpose and what's behind their motive. That's literally the the title of this podcast is what's behind people's purposes. And why do people do what they do? And I love to discover that. And I've literally touched on that 100% with you, Shay. Uh, so that's that's such a privilege to be able to understand your story. But how do people how do people go through that journey? And how do people actually discover that? That's what I'd love to for you to to explain. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for asking. Um, from from my personal experience, because everybody has different uh, perceptions, understandings of how they do this stuff. But what makes you tick? Like, what, 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 what makes you jive? Like, I do real estate here in the States, in Arizona, and that doesn't make me tick. It doesn't make, like, like, cool. Real estate's cool. Uh, I enjoy that stuff. But what makes me tick is from the moment I wake up, the moment I go to bed every single day, is I am trying to master the skill sets within this industry of, of, of being a mentor, of being uh, an influencer, of being a, an inspirational person to, to speak life into people is, is what makes you tick. But... A lot of people can't figure out what they really enjoy doing until they discover what led them to where they are now. There's so many people I talk to between 18 and 25, and that's like the, like the, the sweet spot right now of, 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 of young adults that are coming out of high school trying to figure out that they have nothing, no idea what they're doing. Like they're, they're walking around in a land of nothingness of like, where do I go? What do I do? Because they're always trying to do what society wants them to do. They're mm -hmm. always trying to fill what their parents told them what they should do. They're always trying to pursue, uh, and it could be from goodwill. It could be from a, a well-intentioned of direction, but let me tell you what, 
you become a you can become a major league baseball player. I hated every part of it. I hated every part of my job and dream, right? Because I wasn't I wasn't made to do that. I was just given that opportunity to create a platform to allow myself to have a, a voice and a story. That's just part of my journey. But what it is is that what makes you tick? What do you enjoy doing? Where, where do you want to go? Like, like, what do you spend most of your time on? It, 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 whether you're a, a chef or whether you're a homemaker, whether you're but like, but whatever it is, like, not everybody's meant to be an entrepreneur. Not everybody's meant to be an influencer. Not everybody's meant to be speaking from stages like I do. Not everybody's meant to be creating videos that are just speaking life and people. That's cool. A lot of people are like, dude, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't get that. But what it is, is like, ask yourself that. What do you like to do? What do you want to do? And let me tell you this. When The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, came to the WWE, I believe that's what it is now. When I was growing up, it's called the WWF. He came up, his grandfather and his dad were professional wrestlers. So uh, Vince McMahon, the owner of the WWE, gave The Rock the name that was both of his grandfather, both his dad and his grandfather's name. And that was his character. And that's what Vince McMahon said. This is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to be smiling. You're supposed to be happy. You're supposed to be that guy that goes out there and just like, go get it. So he tried that and he did that. And he worked himself all the way up to be the champion of WrestleMania 13. And when he became the champion of WrestleMania 13, he was on the mat after he just won. And the whole arena was saying, Rocky sucks. Rocky sucks. Rocky sucks. And he leaned over to the referee and he turned over and the referee told him, don't listen to him. Don't worry about that. Because the referee could see it visibly on Rock, the Rock's face, visibly affected him. Why was it affecting him? Because he wasn't who he truly was. He was being told that he, you need to be this character and you need to do this. You need to be smiling. You need to form this. And this is so relatable to life. And The Rock was sharing this with Oprah on an interview, and he walked into Vince McMahon's office the next day after winning the Intercontinental Championship of WrestleMania 13. Yeah, we know it's all fake. Yeah, we know it's a character, whatever. But this becomes part of their identity of who they are. So he sat there and he said, Vince, Raw is our next main event coming up after this. Raw, look at that. I don't, I'm not a wrestling fan. And he said, just give me one minute on the mic to be who I truly am. And he says, if I want to be smiling, I'll be smiling. If I want to frown, I'll frown. If I want to go off and then let my, my trueness come out, let me do that and let me run the crowd. Let me just see who I am. Just give me one minute. And this man who's like the ultimate like a personality, ultimate like in control, he said, okay, I'll give you one minute. And in that one minute on the microphone, on Raw, that's where The Rock was born. Eyebrow came up. Do you smell what The Rock is cooking? He was himself. And that's when he was formed into who he truly was because he could put himself, I got the good spots, into that yeah, character yeah. of who he is. And what is he now? He's the number one movie star, actor, and he's the number one wrestler in the world. And he, nobody knows how he started. He's a third generation wrestler who had to live up the expectations of his dad and his grandfather. And it's crazy how he tells his story. He says, you have to understand your true identity. You have to, you have to. And once you do that and once you pursue that and once you connect with that and identify with that, that's when you're really born. Because that's when you can tap into your true gifts and your true talents, not the surface level stuff that you think you're tapping into right now. See, most people come to that 60% threshold of the potential of who they are as a physical human being. See, the mind is unlimited. The potential of our mind is unlimited, brother. But what happens is that belief system, unless it's tapped into 60% of what we're capable of doing. When we get knocked down, we get achieve that, we experience that failure. When we get knocked on our back, when you have a failure after failure, when you take a step back or a setback, like I was telling you before, that's when we have a struggle. That's when people just plateau out because that belief system kicks in to reconfirm what they told themselves their whole life. I can't do that. So now that defines them. And now you get defined of mediocrity. Now you get defined, defined as complacency. And between 18 and 25, so many kids 
Sorry again, I don't want to say kids. So many young adults are complacent because their belief system has been formed through this. Society, technology, what I'm supposed to do. And unfortunately, like for myself, I was like, I don't care what you say, I'm going to go do what I do. And that led me down a path of self-destruction because I was disconnected from who I was. But now, it's just like, I have fulfillment. And the one thing I tried to achieve when I was hitting in front of millions of people on a baseball field, when I was on TV making millions of dollars, living out life of star status and celebrity status, the one thing I yearned for was the same thing you're trying to see. Same thing your listeners and viewers are trying to see. The fullness, happiness, joy, peace. What is it? Life's purpose. I couldn't pursue it. So many people can't pursue it. And I see it. And I'm like, I get so like, ah, oh, watch out, dude. I talked to a guy yesterday who was a real estate agent in Hollywood who's making $10 million a year. And just playing on the phone with him, I'm like, dude, this guy is lost. He's so gone. He's struggling. Like, I feel bad for him, but I can't speak to him because he's successful. And he's mm -hmm. going from $10 million to $100 million. I'm going to do this and that. I'm like, oh, my gosh, dude, I wish I could help this guy. So that's what's driving me. And that's hopefully I was able to give a little bit of information. If you want to understand what it's like to start believing in yourself, a lot of people are like, well, what do I do to believe in myself? There's one little tool, one little tip that I can give you that will help. See, what happens is about three months ago, I was struggling with YouTube. I want to put my videos on YouTube. The algorithms of YouTube are pretty insane. So I got connected with this guy who's a YouTube master that has this system and this training program of YouTube that he sells for thousands of dollars and teach people how to leverage the platform of YouTube to monetize it to grow their brand. And before I get on that phone call with this young gentleman that's a master of YouTube, see, I don't want to put him to work. I don't want to try to figure it out. I don't want to go through the trenches of the algorithms and the tags and the descriptions. Like, I just, that's not my lane. My lane is getting in front of a camera. So it's been holding me back because I don't understand it. And I don't want to put in the effort to go out there and master YouTube. So I've been struggling with that platform YouTube. Like going into that phone call, my belief system of, of understanding, like of being successful on YouTube was maybe like at a level two. But as I was telling this young man where I wanted to go, what I was doing, I was on a Zoom call with him. He's like, look in your message box. I looked in my message box. He's like, I sent you a link to my training program on how to master YouTube. And when I saw that, because I know how this stuff works with the belief system, when I saw that, I was like, holy crap. All I have to do is implement this system of what he says and watch you step by step by step of how to build your brand on YouTube. My belief system went from two to a hundred because I knew if I just implemented that, that system, that process, that program that, that what he had put out there for me, if I just do that, I'll have success on YouTube. So what does that mean? What that means is that when you set out to start to do something, to try to have success in something, you have to seek out a mentor, step one. You have to seek out a mentor, somebody who's been there and done that. And it's easier now for somebody that's been there and done that. You can do it on YouTube. You can do it on social media. The information's out there. Or you can find someone in person. You can find a coach. You can find someone who resonate with to have them teach you, have them mentor you. You've got to get someone who's been there and done that. And step number two, you have to have that person lay out a path for you, step by step. This is how you go. This is how you start. And step number three is the most difficult is you have to implement that. Mm -hmm. So many people seek that mentor. So many people get that system, step one, step two, but they don't implement it. Why? Because they don't believe they could do it. So to start and to retrain that belief system of where everything starts, every successful person believes that they can do it. They actually believe that they're better than what they are. And they're, they're, they're competing against the fullest version of who they are. It's not when they think they're better than you or anybody else. They think they're better than what they are because I'm always, I think I'm better than what I am right now because I'm always pursuing that fullest version of myself. I don't compete against anybody. So what happens is if you implement that system, you can believe that you will achieve what you set out to do, whether it's a dream or vision, goals, a task, whatever it is. That's how the mind works, systematic and those processes. The uncluttered mind is systematic, like I'm telling you. So many people get cluttered with information, and they don't take action. So you got to take action, massive action, brother. And it has to be imperfect action. Every successful person started somewhere. and But the reason why they started is because they believed that they will achieve. you got to start. 
But most people don't start because they don't believe. So if you don't believe, and if you're setting out to do something, to try to tap into that identity of who you truly are, find someone, implement a system, and customize that system for you. You have to have sensory acuity when you take off. Sensory acuity is, a, is extreme knowledge of understanding at what you're trying to do. See, if you were to watch a major league baseball game and you saw that pitch coming in, that was called it's called a slider, and, and, and it comes in curves like this. You, you'd be like, well, that's a great slider as a fan. And my sensory acuity of a master at the top level of understanding what that pitch is, I would identify that as a slider that has a one and a half inch depth and moves uh, two inches down this way. And it started on the outer third of the plate and it ended up out of the plate, off the plate, away, out of the strike zone, down three inches. Like that's how we compute it. That's sensory acuity. How do you get that? You're not born with that. Everybody's capable of achieving that. What it is is taking action, going out there and getting your reps and doing it and doing it. My first podcast sucked. My first video sucked. I was so scared. I was fumbling my words. I didn't know what I was doing. I was afraid of what people were doing. See, most people's fear kicks in when they get generalized thoughts. What is that fear of? That fear is other people's opinion, number one, right? And why are people afraid of other people's opinion? Because they're afraid that that person won't love them. That person won't approve of them. See, what happens is, I don't think people will approve of people if they're not who they are. And if you are aligned and attached with your true identity, you'll attract the people that are supposed to come to you and be in your life. And when you align yourself to who you are, like I said, there's no competition. That's beautiful, man. And I have I have so many more questions. I feel like we can go on for another three hours. Uh -huh. Sure. <laughs> go ahead. Whatever you want. No, we'll leave it for another session uh, because this was, this was beautiful, man. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, just one last question. Where can people find you on Instagram? Uh, do you have a YouTube channel? Where can people find you? Link, link, all your, link all your socials on. Yeah, so what happens is uh, I'm on Facebook at Shea Hillenbend, S-H-E-A-H-I-L-L-E-N-B-A-N-D. It's kind of a crazy name. I hated my name growing up, but it was a great Major League Baseball name because nobody had it. So Shea Hillenbrand in, uh, on Facebook. Instagram will be Shea underscore Hillenbrand. And then LinkedIn, my name Shea Hillenbrand. YouTube, Shea Hillenbrand, but I, that YouTube page is just starting. Uh, but the best place to find me is an IG. Uh, I'm always on there. And if anybody needs anything, uh, I'll be more than happy to help them out. Uh, anything that they, like I said, I'm here to help. And there's no greater feeling in the world than they use your gifts and, gifts and talents to help other people solve their problems. I totally agree. And all those descriptions will be uh, down in the description. And uh, people will know how to spell your name because that's a very difficult name to spell. <laughs> but yeah, they can just look yeah. at the description and um, click the links. Um, thank you so much, Shay, for your time. I really do appreciate this. Uh, it was a privilege to learn your story. And I hope a lot of people out there listening uh, can get something out of this because it's so true to be able to find your identity and then start with your why and then go from there pretty much. Um, I appreciate that, man. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. You have a great day. You too, buddy. Motives. What a journey. What an inspiration to us all that we can literally achieve anything if our mindsets are right, if we have the right focus and the right purpose. Guys, make sure to check him out on Instagram at Shay underscore Helen Brand. All the links will be in the description of this video. Uh, make sure to say hi. Make sure to just reach out to him and start a conversation. He's such a great guy. And obviously, you know that from listening to this entire conversation to the very end. Motives, take care of yourselves. Stay true to yourself. Bye-bye.